so thank you for the introduction. Um, I will be presenting the projected Newton method, uh, which is a new algorithm that we develop for the regularization of post linear inverse problems. So let me jump right in. Um, so suppose we have some, some linear system of equations that we're interested in. So AX is B, uh, where the right-hand side B contains some measurement errors or noise, uh, which we denote by a vector E. So here on the figure on the right, I show some example um, where the green line is some exact data. And the red line is the noisy data. Okay, so if we if we now solve um, the linear system using our exact data, so the green line, then we get this this, this exact solution here at the bottom. Um, but if we solve the same linear system but now using the noisy data, then we get this solution here. Okay, so you can see that the red solution uh, doesn't resemble our exact solution at all. Um, and and why is this the case? Uh, because from some standard perturbation analysis, um, it's possible to derive this bound here. Um, which basically says that um, perturbations in your right-hand side are possibly amplified by the condition number of your matrix. Okay, so if you have a, you have a large ill-conditioned matrix, uh, so just an ill-conditioned matrix, then this implies that you can have large perturbations uh, in the solution as well. So that's that's precisely what happens here. Uh, and of course, this is this is very well known. I think everybody here um, will have seen this at one point. Uh, and it's also quite well known how you could how you could solve this. So, so, so Tikhonov solution, um, so Tikhonov regularization is, is a solution for this problem. Um, so, in general, we do not only consider square matrices, uh, but rectangular matrices as well. Uh, and we would solve these, uh, for instance, using a least squares approach like this. And then, what Tikhonov regularization does, it just adds another term to this optimization problem. So we have this term here, um, which which has the uh, regularization parameter alpha, and then the norm of x squared. So if we now have some good choice of, of parameter alpha, then we get a solution that again um, looks quite nice. So, so here on the figure on the right, I handpicked a very good choice for the regularization parameter and the red curve now again closely resembles our, our exact solution. Okay, but then the question of course is how do we choose this, this, this value for the regularization parameter? Um, so there are multiple ways you can do this. Um, so I'll explain one using, using a different example. So here on this slide, I consider some example from computed tomography. Um, so this problem can also be described using a linear system of equations. And then I generate some data using the exact Shep-Logan phantom. Uh, and then I add some Gaussian noise to, to our data. And if we can solve this, this linear system just using um, the straightforward least squares approach, then we get a very bad and noisy uh, reconstruction. Right, so, so this, is, this is of course well known. Um, so, so what we can do is here on this slide, I, I show you the uh, discrepancy curve. So what is it? Um, so for, for many choices of the regularization parameter, I first compute the Tikhonov solution. Um, so that, that's defined here. Uh, and then I plot the norm of the residual. Okay, and that, that gives you a curve, the blue curve here. And it typically looks something like this. Um, so if we consider, for instance, um, very small values of the regularization parameter, uh, what happens then is we do not put a lot of weight on this term here, so we're basically uh, minimizing the least squares term. Okay, so this thing can of course become well relatively small, but then we know that the solution contains uh, a lot of noise, so we have something that looks like this. Um, on the other hand, if we choose a very large regularization parameter, then we do not put a lot of weight on the least squares term, so this can become much larger. But then the norm of, of your solution uh, is decreased, and this has a smoothing effect uh, on the solution. So we get something um, that looks like this. And then, of course, somewhere in between should be a choice of the regularization parameter that, that balances these, these two effects. Um, and that point can actually be described, uh, for instance, using the discrepancy principle, uh, which states that we should choose our regularization parameter, such that the norm of the residual is equal to the norm of the perturbation in your right-hand side. Okay, so of course, this value here is not known in practice because we do not know the exact data. Um, so, so this approach assumes that we have some good estimates of this value of delta. Okay, so then the question is, um, how, how can we efficiently compute this point? So it's, so it's actually the, the intersection of your discrepancy curve um, with the noise level. Um, and, and actually, this point can be, can be described as a solution of a constraint optimization problem. Okay, so, so if you consider this optimization problem here, so the constraint is, is precisely the discrepancy principle, uh, and our objective function is the regularization term. 
And then if we apply some very standard uh, Lagrangian duality theory, then we can um, write down the optimality conditions of this optimization problem uh, as a nonlinear system of equations defined by this function f here. Okay, so this, this lambda parameter is the, is the Lagrangian multiplier. And if you take a closer look at this function here, so the second component is, is just your constraint. So that expresses uh, the discrepancy principle. And then the first component here is also interesting um, because if you're a root of this first component here uh, with some non-negative Lagrangian multiplier, then you're also a, a Tikhonov solution if we consider the Tikhonov parameter to be one over the Lagrangian multiplier. So, so that can be seen just by rearranging these equations. Um, and it's also possible to show that actually these do not only can uh, express the first order of the melting conditions, but they're also conditions for this problem here. So what this means is that um, if we have solved this, this system of nonlinear equations by, by, by this function here, then we've actually found the point that, that we're interested in. Okay, so solving a nonlinear system of equations, I think most of you will think immediately, okay, let's use uh, Newton's method. But Newton's method is, in this case, not very efficient. Um, so let me explain that. Of course, it's an iterative method, so we have to start from some initial point. Um, and then we generate a sequence of iterates like this. So we take our previous uh, approximate solution, so for the x variables as well as the Lagrangian multipliers, and then we add the Newton step um, multiplied by some suitably chosen step length. And, and, and the Newton step, um, can be computed by solving a linear system of equations. So, so this matrix here is the Jacobian matrix. Um, and, if we, and if we have a lot of variables, then this is a very large linear system. Uh, and then we would need like a crowd of subspace method to solve this thing. Okay, so, so, so this is a symmetric matrix, so we could use like uh, Minras. But then if you think about it, this is quite expensive because first we have an, an outer iteration of, of Newton's method. And then for each outer Newton uh, iteration, we need to perform a bunch of crowd of subspace iterations uh, to solve uh, the linear system. Okay, but in fact, we can actually use crowd of subspace methods uh, in a slightly more sophisticated way. Uh, and to do so, I will take a look at the B-diagonalization algorithm. So, so what it does is it generates a matrix VK and a matrix UK plus one that satisfies some B-diagonalization relation uh, given here. Um, and this B matrix is a very small matrix of so size k plus one uh, times k. So k uh, will be the iteration index um, of the algorithm that, that I described now, so the projected Newton method. Um, and it's a lower bit diagonal matrix. Okay. So in addition, we also have that the range of our of our matrix V is precisely a crowd of subspace given here. All right. So so what this means is that now every point in our crowd of subspace. Um, can be written uh, using using like a small vector y multiplied by the basis vk. Okay, and this in turn means that uh, we can write, for instance, the norm of the residual um, very efficiently using using these expressions. We can rewrite it like this. So we only have the matrix B, and then then the y vector, and then some small vector uh, c. Okay, so this is all very standard stuff. So you would use this, for instance, also in the least squares QR algorithm. Um, so, so we use it in a slightly different way. So if we, if we again take a look at our optimization problem, so this is precisely the same optimization problem that I had before, uh, but instead of minimizing over the whole Euclidean space uh, Rn, I now only minimize over the of subspace. So, so we call this the projected optimization problem. And then using the expressions on the previous slide, I can uh, rewrite this very efficiently uh, using this B matrix and then minimization over just Rk. All right, so, so we know how to express a solution of, of this thing, because it's, again, just a minimization over RK. Um, so the solution can be expressed um, as a solution of a nonlinear system of equations. So in this case, it's defined by this function FK. So, so I call this um, the, projected, the projected function. Okay, so it's a much smaller function, so it only has K plus one uh, unknowns, which means that this could be solved very efficiently, for instance, using Newton's method. And that would give us, of course, an, an approximate solution uh, in the larger subspace. OK, um, but in fact, we do something slightly bit uh, more, more clever. So, so, so consider that we have some approximate solution in a lower dimensional subspace, so in the subspace uh, spanned by vk minus 1. And then we just add 1, 0 to, to this vector. Um, and, and it gives us a larger vector, of course. 
And then for this for this new vector, we perform just a single Newton iteration. Okay, so so this Newton step uh, can can now be be, um, be computed solving a, a much smaller linear system. Um, so it gives us a certain Newton step for this for this projected problem, which we call then the projected Newton step, and we can use this to update this this y bar variable that we have. Okay, so this gives us a new a new uh, vector, but of course um, this also corresponds. Uh, with some updates for the x variables as well, which can be easily seen just by writing out what that means. So we again multiply with our basis. Um, and then just uh, if we define this new search direction delta xk to be uh, the projected Newton direction multiplied by the basis, then we get a very uh, simple form. So we see that this is actually is some new search direction. Okay, so at the moment we have no guarantee that this is, well, something something clever, something good. Um, but actually, what we can do is show this theorem here. Um, and what this theorem says is that if we define delta xk to be precisely what I uh, just explained, then this is actually a descent direction for, for this merit function here. So this merit function, which is the norm of f squared, um, well, it's often used in, in line search algorithms uh, for solving a system of nonlinear equations. And, and what this theorem implies is that we always can find some, some, some step length gamma such that the sufficient decrease condition um, is satisfied. And this actually um, makes sure that we that we make progress towards, towards the solution. OK, so that's actually basically enough um, for, to, for us to, to, to formulate the projected Newton method. So, so what we do is we have some crowd of subspace basis. We, we look at the projected problem, uh, and we just perform one single Newton iteration for the projected problem. But then, of course, we also have a search direction in a larger space. And then we use this search direction um, with some backtracking line search to, to, to get uh, closer towards the solution uh, with this sufficient decrease condition. All right. And then we check, OK, is the solution accurate enough? And then if not, then we just expand our crowd of subspace basis and keep iterating uh, like this. OK, so, so it's actually basically uh, very simple. And, and it also works quite nicely. So here uh, I show two figures. Uh, so it's the same experiment with the computer tomography problem from a few slides ago. And on the left figure, I show convergence um, on the discrepancy curve for two different choices of the initial regularization parameter. And you can see that, that they both converge nicely towards the intersection point of our discrepancy curve um, with the noise level. OK, so it, so it works very nicely. And, and on the figure on the right, I compare this, this new method just by using the naive approach uh, with Newton. Uh, and I compare the number, the number of matrix vector products. Um, and on the y-axis, I plot the norm of our function. And you can see that the projected Newton method converges uh, much, much more quickly. So it's pretty, pretty nice result. Um, but of course, thicken of regularization has its, has its uh, limitations. So we would like to do some more, more uh, fancy stuff. So, so one thing that we want to do is, for instance, use some kind of regularization matrix um, that expresses, for instance, a finite difference operator, or uh, we would like some, some sparsity-inducing regularization term uh, and stuff like that. Um, and actually, what we can do is we can extend our approach to solve problems of this form here, where we have some general um, convex and twice differentiable uh, regularization function. And, and actually, not that much changes. Uh, for instance, if we look at the, at the first order optimality conditions, they look very similar, with the only difference being here the gradient of this psi function. Okay, So, so this causes some troubles, um, because we can't simply project it on a crowd of subspace anymore, because that doesn't work. Um, but in fact, if we, if we project it on what we call a, generous, a generalized crowd of subspace, um, then, then things, things again work nicely. So how is it defined? It's defined by evaluating the first component of our function in the previous iterates, and then using uh, Gram-Schmidt to, to obtain some orthonormal basis. Okay, if we do that, then we can actually very similarly prove that if you have some uh, projected Newton direction, if you multiply it again with your basis, that we get some search direction uh, in the larger space that's, that's a descent direction, and, and everything generalizes nicely. Okay, so, so we, we have used this approach um, um, in sparsity um, reconstruction, where we have some um, some sparse exact solution, and and this this is achieved by um, considering some smooth approximation of the of the L1 norm, um, and and this also works quite nicely if we have some some good approximation of the absolute value function, 
uh, and it looks like I'm running out of time. So let me quickly go to the conclusions. So, so let me lastly mention that, that we have some very interesting ongoing research as well, where we not only consider uh, linear inverse problems, but we are also starting to consider nonlinear inverse problems. And we have some very interesting initial results about that. So I hope to publish something about it very soon. And then I'll just finish here with some references. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm waiting if I see any questions. Not yet. I, I would like to ask a question. So you, you showed that it, it, this projected approach is much faster than um, uh, than standard Newton, but it, it seems like a linear convergence from from that from that graph. Is that right? That can actually happen. Either your your qual of subspace is all large enough to contain the solution of the full dimensional problem, and in that case, we would have we can actually we can actually observe like the quadratic convergence that that you would have had from Newton's method. But there are other problems where the dimension of the qual of subspace is kind of limiting the accuracy that you can get, and then you see this this kind of linear rate of convergence um, of, of the of this of this value. 